Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first phase of your virtual stewardship training. My name is Rose Richardson. I'm the Conservation and Stewardship Specialist at the, in the Northwest Land Conservancy, and I'll be your stewardship coordinator while you're a steward with us. So um, before we get started, I want to take a minute to thank you in advance for your commitment to our mission, your support of our work, and your active passion for conservation and land protection. The monitoring you're going to do, the projects you'll complete, you're going to make a significant difference on our lands and our understanding of them. And a lot of people and wildlife that use these lands will unknowingly but greatly benefit from your work. You know, you're making a big difference by taking this step today. And I can't thank you enough for taking that step with us at INLC. I want to thank you too for your commitment to staying home and staying healthy and keeping those around you safe. COVID-19 has just really shaken up the world in a lot of really unpredicted ways. So thank you too for bearing with us as we adopt this training to be in a virtual format. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get back in the field together soon and continue building our, our stewardship and land conservation community. But until then, you know what, we're making it work and I'm really thankful to you for doing your part to protect others. So with that, I guess we'll get started uh, with this presentation, starting with an introduction into land trusts and the Inland Northwest Land Conservancy. So what is a land trust? <laughs> I get this question all the time. A land trust is a nonprofit, non-governmental, and non-political organization. And we protect land for a, a lot of reasons, really. Wildlife habitat, recreation, open space, scenic beauty, agriculture. And every land trust is a little bit different. But the goal of each one is generally tailored to the needs of their community and the needs of the land around that community. And land trusts are really kind of a, a hub for conservation work. We work with governmental and non-governmental partners to protect critical lands. We work with private landowners who wanna protect their lands from development. We work with restoration partners to enhance the habitats on the lands we protect. Uh, we work with interest groups like Audubon Society or the Native Plant Society to identify those priority lands and to build landscape knowledge. And we work with volunteers like you to engage and educate our community in the fun and important work we do. So we really get a lot of people under, under one roof to get these great projects done. Uh, there are about 1,600 land trusts in the United States, 28 in Washington, and about 20 in Idaho. And there are land trusts-like organizations internationally, but land trusts like INLC are a uniquely American organization. And I'll, I'll throw a pretty baffling number at you here. Altogether, land trusts have protected almost 10 million acres of land across the country. And we're steadily building on that acreage and ramping up our, our protection speed every year. So that number is always growing and it's growing fast, which is very exciting. <laughs> so um, now I guess for a little information on the Inland Northwest Land Conservancy. So the Inland Northwest Land Conservancy, INLC, uh, originally I, Inland Northwest Land Trust, was formed by a group of volunteers and conservationists in 1991. They kind of cobbled together a few projects and by 1997 had hired their first all-in-one jack of all trades, Chris DeForest, who is still protecting the lands you love with INLC now. The land trust has grown in size over the last three decades and has now protected 22,000 acres of land throughout Eastern Washington and Northern Idaho. We're an accredited land trust with the Land Trust Alliance, which means that we must meet certain standards in our land protection process. Every project we do must provide some kind of public benefit. We must have a conservation-centric reason for protecting the lands that we do. We have to carefully monitor those lands uh, at least once per year. And we must have full financial records to demonstrate that we're using your donations responsibly. And every five years, we're audited to make sure that we're keeping up with these standards. As I mentioned, 
uh, every land trust mission is a little bit different depending on the needs of the community. Given Spokane's undying thirst for good trails, healthy waters, and wildlife, we prioritize the protection of lands that provide that public access or protect water quality and secure healthy habitat for our wildlife. But we also try to put special emphasis on areas that are expected to be highly adaptive as shifting conditions alter our landscape. And um, let's see, here are a few of our stats. To date, INLC has protected 41 miles of lake shoreline, 26 miles of stream and river corridors, and as I mentioned earlier, 22,000 acres of land. And those numbers go up all the time. We're always completing new projects that add to those numbers. So land trusts use three main tools to protect land. We can purchase and manage the land directly. We call these lands preserves. Another tool is the conservation easement, which I'll go into in a second. The third is facilitation or partnership, basically being an intermediary between a landowner and another land protection partner. Okay, so preserve ownership. INLC currently has about 300 acres under our direct ownership. We monitor these lands carefully and we manage them for their most appropriate use, public access, habitat, water quality. And the lands that INLC has purchased outright are very high priority areas. They're linchpin properties in a recreation corridor, or they contain critical wildlife habitat or present a really unique rest restoration opportunity. Uh, you know, INLC in general is not trying to acquire a bunch of preserve land, but you know what, where action is needed, action is needed. And we're happy to step in and protect lands that are worth protecting. Because INLC is the sole land manager for these preserved properties, we will be asking a lot of you to steward them. An extra set of eyes and ears goes a long way on lands like these. The next tool we use is the conservation easement, and INLC has completed around 60 conservation easements, totaling about 8,000 acres. A little bit of background here. So not everyone knows what a conservation easement is. Um, every property in the US has a bundle of rights assigned to it. These rights belong to the property, not the owner. But if a property has really wonderful habitat, for example, or would protect regional water quality, some kind of major public benefit, a landowner can resign one particular right that will protect those public values forever, and that's the right to develop. This forms kind of the foundation of the conservation easement. We then work with the landowner to create what we call a development envelope, usually about three acres. So the landowner can build a home, improve that home, have barns or stables, gardens, wells, all kinds of stuff, but confine all of that development to a single area, which protects the vast majority of the property and what we call the conservation values, the open space for wildlife browsing, the creek corridor that protects water quality, the forests that maintain the scenic beauty. So, INLC doesn't own these lands, but with the conservation easement, we have protected the critical habitats and public values of that property. And as I mentioned earlier, land trusts are required to monitor properties like these at least once per year. So we know they're still in good condition and the values we set out to protect are still intact. Because most of these are privately owned, INLC will need to play kind of a matchmaker a little bit with stewards that are willing to monitor private lands and landowners that are willing to host a steward on their property. But I expect many in our landowner community will be very eager to have a steward help them keep an eye on their lands and help with any restoration projects they'd like to do. And this would be a great way to explore a brand new place if that's something that you're interested in. The last tool we use is facilitation which is basically working with a broad spectrum of land protection partners. We've helped protect nearly 14,000 acres of land this way. Land trusts are uniquely suited to getting projects done quickly. So we partner with other groups that might be more constrained to protect critical lands as fast as possible. We work with federal, state, local, and tribal government agencies like Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife or Spokane County Parks 
and Washington State Parks to permanently protect land. And then we work with restoration partners like Ducks Unlimited or Department of Environmental Quality uh, and local conservation districts to restore those lands to good health. And these are all projects that without INLC's help may not have happened at all. We've preserved several parts of major parks and trail networks like those on Antoine Peak or Mica Peak, Salty's Flats or Riverside State Park. And we've helped to protect thousands of acres of critical wildlife habitat in areas like Slave and Conservation Area or Turnbull Wildlife Refuge. We've even helped protect several segments of the Centennial Trail. We're all over the place. And these lands are not managed by INLC and we don't have a conservation easement on the property, but we do have an interest in making sure the property is healthy and taken care of. If you do end up stewarding one of these properties, you'll be working with me but you may also end up working with other land managers of that property. And nearly every land protection partner we've spoken with loves the idea of having stewards on the property. You all are a valuable asset in land protection. So get ready for some interesting projects to come your way. And this is a map of our completed projects. The light blue dots are conservation easements. The bright blue dots are partner projects and the dark blue dots are INLC's preserves. As you can see, we have projects all over the place, but properties you're most likely to steward are in Spokane and Kootenai counties. All right, now that we've gone over INLC's history and how we work, I think we're ready to dive into the Volunteer Land Steward Program. We have three main goals for this program. The first is to have an extra set of eyes and ears on the property, especially those that allow public use. This helps INLC and other land managers to quickly respond to issues on the property and create ways to prevent those issues. We'd also like your help in completing projects on the land as well. Things like invasive species removal or planting or garbage removal. But if you've got experience or want to gain experience in something specific like wildlife monitoring or trail building, we have projects you can help with that fit those interests as well. The ultimate goal of this program is to enhance and protect land for wildlife and for future generations. We want our work to outlive us so people 100 years from now can enjoy the same or better natural spaces than we enjoy now. And here are the basic expectations of the program. We'd like you to visit your property and write up a quick report about it at least once per quarter. Some properties may require a little more visits, so the amount of time you're willing to commit to field time may dictate which properties are available to you to steward. We also want pretty regular communication, especially if you run into significant issues on your property. Generally, we ask for your monitoring reports at the end of the quarter. But if you run into a homeless camp or a huge pile of trash that you just can't take care of on your own, please don't wait until the end of the quarter to let us know about it. And give us a heads up too if you can't monitor for a quarter. Say you're still in school and have a really hectic quarter or you're going on a trip and won't be able to fit in a site visit. It's all fine, just keep us in the loop. We also ask that you be a good ambassador of INLC. We want you to be, you know, you project respect toward everyone you meet, uh, knowledge of your property and why it was important to protect it, and show off your strong stewardship ethic. It rubs off. The last expectation is a commitment of at least two years in the program. The nature of our work is just long term. So the monitoring you'll do, the projects you'll help with, it'll be hard for your work to really take shape in less than a couple of years. Okay, so I, I want to touch really quickly on one of those points, which is ambassadorship. You all are essentially a passive mentor for everyone you meet on a property, so make sure to set a good example. If you bring your dog with you, always keep it on a leash and pick up after it. I know this one can be really hard to follow sometimes, but off-leash dogs can make some folks very uncomfortable. And dogs definitely can disturb wildlife, which is often why the lands were protected in the first place. So as tempting as it is to let them off leash, keep them on all the time. Um, pack it in, pack it out. 
And if you see litter on the land, pick it up and pack that out too. Give wildlife a lot of space and make sure any friends you bring along do the same. And try to stay on marked trails, unless you're specifically monitoring something off trail. Education is another important component of stewardship. You know, we can take care of the land, but if other people that use the land aren't aware of our work and unknowingly cause some of the problems we're trying to fix, then we'll just be going in circles. So if you meet someone that wants to learn more, be able to teach them a little bit about what you do. What is your role as a steward? What is INLC and what do we do? Be able to tell people about the property and why it was important to protect it. And if you have any fun tidbits of information about local flora or fauna or natural history of any kind, share that with them. Those little tidbits stick around in people's brains. And I want to reiterate too that everyone's stewardship journey is a little bit different. You know, we're here for different reasons. We want to see different things and learn different things. So if educating the public is just not your forte or you're not interested in doing that, please don't feel pressured. I, I'm just amazed at how far a little teaching moment with a stranger can go. So if you're willing, sharing what you know can really bolster a lot of support for the land and have a big positive impact. And as I mentioned earlier, you may also be working with other land managers, depending on which property you end up stewarding. So please be a good representative for those partners and follow through with any commitments you make uh, and keep them up to speed on what you're doing in the field. Okay, so the value of a steward. Technically, the value of an hour of volunteer time is about $25.43. If we go off this number, each site visit you do would add anywhere from $50 to $100 of value to our work and $200 to $400 per year if you did one site visit per quarter. That's a lot of value right there. And if you do anything beyond those basic requirements, you're adding even more value. And that's just from going off of a simplified dollar amount. Um, but really the value you add is so much more than that. I mean, <laughs> many of you, work in the conservation or natural science realm or have retired from it. Many of you belong to interest groups like Audubon Society or Spokane Fly Fishers or Native Plant Society. Many of you come to the program from various user groups like mountain bike coalitions or trail groups. And these experiences help you monitor, they give you a unique perspective in the field and they can help INLC as we come, you know, as we complete projects. But Really, the most important thing you need to add value to this work is passion. All of you want to do good work on the land, and I am blown away by the level of interest here. You know, your eagerness to learn new things and new skills, and that sheer drive to make a difference on the land is just so valuable. Without that passion for our lands, where would we be? So whether you're a seasoned outdoors person or brand new to field work or volunteering, we're so glad to have you here with us in the stewardship program and you add a lot of value to the work we do. Your support will have an, you know, a, a really positive impact on thousands of trail users. Many generations of wildlife will unknowingly benefit from your work and the healthy habitats we create together will literally outlive us. And that's a beautiful thing. We'll be building a strong stewardship community at the same time too. So that's another bonus. Um, so anyway, I just want to remind you that your commitment to stewardship drives these positive changes and adds so much more value to our work than a measly 25 bucks an hour. So be proud of you. We're doing great stuff. Okay, so the first step in creating that lasting change is monitoring. I said the word monitoring a lot, but what does that mean exactly? Monitoring whether it's INLC staff, a land management partner, or you as a steward, is an attempt to record changes to the landscape. And landscapes are big. And if we look at them from a broad view, they might not appear to change that much. But if we take a more careful look at the details, landscapes change quite a bit, even over short periods of time. These smaller scale changes are what we want to find and report through our monitoring. And then we want to take those changes and compare them year over year to paint broader but accurate trends for the lands of the Inland Northwest. 
And the information you gather will help us plan habitat restoration efforts, decide what kinds of lands should be a priority for protection, and could also help us get grant funding for specific projects like tree plantings or trail building. And by regularly monitoring, you're also able to help us keep an eye on sensitive areas. As I mentioned, INLC staff have to monitor a lot of properties every year, which unfortunately means we can't spend much time with any of them. A critical value you bring in your monitoring is just keeping an extra set of eyes and ears open on the properties so we can be more responsive land managers. So to capture this information and submit it to INLC, you'll fill out a basic monitoring report. The observations can be as specific as you're comfortable with, but the more information you can pack into those notes, the more helpful it'll be. And regardless of detail, these reports shouldn't take more than an hour to fill out, so don't go too crazy. The questions on the forms are left intentionally broad. And this is to allow you all as stewards to kind of explore a little bit. We all have different interests, so feel free to follow those and monitor your property in a way that excites you. Your monitoring should be as fulfilling for you as it is helpful for us. And this presentation video is just the first phase of your training. The middle phase is to watch the virtual monitoring of Rimrock to Riverside video, which goes into a few apps I use when I walk through a property and identifies items that are helpful to note in your reports. But we'll go through a report really quickly here too, so you guys get the gist. Um, so you must submit one report per quarter, but what if you want to visit your property more often than that? That's, I mean, that's great. Send in as many reports as you want. Um, just send them all together at the end of the quarter. So we're just going to move through a monitoring report form here in a few segments. Um, so this is the top portion of the first page. The, the report itself is only a couple pages. Um, so most of these boxes, as you'll notice, are, are pretty self-explanatory. It's just a property name, the quarter, and the names of everyone that went on the site visit. But I'll touch on the total hours box really quickly. So you'll want to record from the time you left your house to the time you returned. And if you had a friend join you that isn't a steward, their hours count in that total hours tally as well. So multiply the number of hours you were out on a site visit by the number of people that went. Um, so here's here's an example. Uh, we've, I've I've kind of filled this in um, <laughs> as as a mock uh, report here. So Douglas Fur is a land steward with us. He's going on a monitoring visit to the Rimrock Riverside property, and he's brought his friends uh, Lady Fern and Grand Fur. Uh, all together, they were on the property for about four hours, and because there were three of them helping out, even though Lady and Grand aren't technically stewards, 12 hours of work were invested into that site visit. So the number that you'd want to put into that total hours box is 12 hours. Okay, so part two of the form is really asking about what you saw. It'll give you a couple of checkbox prompts. You know, did you see people? Were there landform changes? Were there vegetation changes? Were there signs of inappropriate use? And then the next box asks for a little bit more detail on those questions. So during his site visit, Doug Fur and his buds did see a few folks. And then he gives a little bit of a description here. He saw some mountain bikes and a walker with an off-leash dog. Doug even asks the walker to leash his dog and gives him a little reason why that's important. And it made the guy leash his dog. And this is kind of a, a feel-good example, but this happens all the time. Many people just don't know the impacts of the things that they do and need a gentle reminder to nudge them in the right direction. So if you have an interaction like that, put it in your report. That's great to know. Uh, so Doug also saw a couple of landform changes. Uh, a big tree blew over and disturbed the ground quite a bit, so he put that in his report. Another example of something you might put in here is trail erosion. Um, but really, landform changes aren't that common. Probably the most common thing I note in here is tree blowdown. Um, this is also the place to note hydrologic changes on the property. What is the water doing? And Doug mentions that in his report here too. 
According to his notes, the big wetland in the southwest corner of the property has a higher water level now than when he visited last year. He doesn't really quantify that in his report. He's just simply recording his observation, which is still really helpful. Um, but if you wanted to add a number to that, you could note the depth at a specific point month over month, and that would be good to capture, or the width of the wetland, um, which you can do with a tool I show you in the next video. Um, so water is an extremely dynamic feature on our inland northwest landscape. So noting any water-related change is really helpful. So keep an eye on the water on your property if there is any. Uh, so next, Doug notes some vegetation changes. He found a couple of patches of invasive plants on the property, some common mullins and sulfur sink foil. Um, and he also tries to give a little bit of a location, suggesting that they're near uh, uh, between a burnover area on the property and the main trail. Um, so he notes here too that he dropped a pin in a venza, marking the location of the mullein. And Avenza is a really helpful monitoring app that I will show you how to use in the next video. Uh, so inappropriate use is another important thing to capture here. Uh, this is where our big work items usually come from, like trash removal and closing social trails. Those are, those are the most common. Um, so Doug found some garbage along Houston Road east of the ponds, which included a few tires and a mattress. He also noticed some social trails starting to form, but they were still pretty small and could actually be wildlife. He wasn't sure. Um, and this is really helpful. As a staff, I read a note like that and can say, okay, we need to check on that in another month and see if those trails have gotten any bigger. And if they have, we can go back and close them because they're probably not made by humans, or they, they probably are made by humans, not wildlife. Okay, so this last part of the form asks for a little bit more detail on the wildlife. Clearly, Doug saw a lot of wildlife on the property, and he kept a pretty good list. And again, he tagged all of his wildlife sightings in Avenza, um, as he notes at the top of his, uh, his notes here, so we can see exactly where he spotted them. Um, and all wildlife you see is great to note, but please pay close attention to species like um, birds, amphibians, and reptiles, if you can. Wildlife migration patterns are, are starting to shift pretty significantly, actually, and we want to capture that change and restore the lands to keep wildlife here, if possible. Birds, amphibians, and reptiles are good to watch because a lot of them are indicator species. They help us gauge the health of the landscape, and they're usually the first to take off and migrate away from an area when it becomes too unhealthy. So if we see significant change, in birds and amphibians and reptiles, we can kind of guess that there might be something wrong. The last big question asks about projects you did on site. So Doug created GPS tracks of the potential social trails he found, and he picked up the garbage on Houston Road. He also notes his interaction with the dog walker here as well, which is a good idea. You know, talking with trail users might not feel like a project, but it does have an impact. So you can include it here if you want. And the last two boxes um, ask you if there were any issues on the property that needed INLC staff attention, and if you attach any photos to your report. Doug said he didn't have to call us about any big work items. Um, he could have called us about the tires and the mattresses, but he had friends and felt comfortable taking care of it himself, so he didn't call us for that one. And he did at attach some, uh, some photos for us to look at. Um, any of the items that you note in the first part of that report, you know, the tree blowdown, the noxious weeds, the social trails, the trash, take pictures of that and send them to us. And if you complete a project like trash pickup, take before and after photos. Those are really, really helpful for us. So I'll go into these tools uh, much more extensively during the next video, but um, I, I find all of them quite helpful. It, it seems strange to use your phone so much when you're outside, but these apps can help you navigate the property better, uh, share information with us, report invasive species, identify species you don't know, or keep track of species you see in the field. 
all good stuff. You don't need to use any of these, but I personally feel like I'm more effective when I do. Uh, it feels like the information I'm gathering is, is more useful. So I, I highly recommend you try some of these out. Okay, interacting with the public. I, I wanted to include this great Aldo Leopold quote at the top here. When we see the land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. That's just a reminder to all of us that the outdoors should be a place for everyone. And creating a welcoming and inclusive environment is something everyone can do, especially us as stewards. So, you know, thank trail users that are using good trail etiquette. And if you run into someone doing something they shouldn't, kill them with kindness. You know, creating a sense of community for someone who needs it could not only change their life in that moment, but it could change the way they treat the land as well. So um, be thinking about that as, as you're out on the land and meeting people. So, you know, in your monitoring, no matter where your property is, you are going to run into other people, hikers, bikers, birders, horseback riders, fishers, the occasional homeless person. So I just want to go through really quickly how we, we were hoping you will interact with people you meet in the field. Um, so we will provide uh, volunteer land steward lanyards to help identify you as a steward with INLC. Um, and that will uh, come with a badge um, that uh, has your name uh, and INLC logo on the front. Printed on the backs of your badges will be my contact information, the contact information for any other land managers you may be working with, and a few non-emergency numbers to know in case you need to report something to the police or the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Very unlikely you'll need that information, but it's there in case you need it. And uh, I wanna be very clear here, the badges do not give you the power to enforce laws on public lands. You all are observers, not enforcers. If you see an issue on your property, call the proper authorities. Do not insert yourself into situations that could easily escalate. And although you have every right to steward your property, some land users may disagree or just misunderstand your role. So you can tell people about your work and why you're doing it, but if anyone still has concerns about it, please give them my contact information and we'll get things sorted out. Okay, so homeless camps, really, the only irritable people I've met on a property so far have been homeless people. And obviously not all homeless folks are unsafe to be around or interact with, but some can be, especially if they feel like their camp is at risk of being reported and hauled away. So if you do meet up with a homeless person uh, and, and they do have a camp, just call the Spokane Police Non-Emergency Line. They'll come to the site escort the person off the property and get them to a shelter where they can get better resources. And once they're off the property, we can then go in and clean up the camp. You may also notice needles on some of these properties. It, it, it's a, a fairly common problem, unfortunately. Um, please don't feel pressured to pick them up. <laughs> they're, they're definitely a safety hazard. Just take a photo drop a pin at its, its location using a Venza, which we'll learn to do in the next video again, and then let staff take care of it. Um, if you do feel safe picking up needles, please, please, please only do so if you have gloves and a hard plastic sealable container to put the needle in, like a disposable water bottle. I, I often find uh, trash that I can store needles in before I dispose of them. And that's, that's kind of a good segue into safety, which is our next, our next topic. The first priority of stewardship is your safety. The information you gather for us, the projects you do, it's valuable stuff, but it's not worth your personal safety. So please understand the risks of your field work, be prepared for those risks, and maintain good situational awareness while you're in the field. You know, being truly prepared can make the difference between a good day and a bad day in the field. So make sure to take care of yourself. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna run through some of the potential hazards of stewardship and field work. Really, these are just hazards of going outside. Many of them are no different than the hazards you face while going for a hike, but you should still be prepared for these. 
So the first hazard is weather. <laughs> it's something that maybe we don't think about that often, but um, you know, we look outside, make a quick judgment call and go for a hike or a bike or whatever. But when you're out monitoring or doing a project for a few hours and you're kind of out in the boonies a little bit, knowing what weather is headed your way is really important. So make sure to check the weather before you leave your house. Um, and also check to see if there are wind advisories. Um, most of you will be monitoring in areas with trees. So if, if uh, you do see uh, a wind advisory, just don't monitor your property that day. Uh, a tree falling on you while you're in the field is unlikely, but branches snap all the time and can also cause a lot of damage. So just as a rule of thumb, if there is a high wind advisory, don't go in the field. Um, and make sure to have appropriate layers and footwear for the day. Um, nothing ruins a day in the field like being caught in a rainstorm without your jacket. I'm speaking from experience there. <laughs> it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So pack more than less for sure. Uh, and always consider driving conditions before you leave as well. If extreme weather is going to impact your safety behind the wheel, just stay home. We don't want you sliding on ice or getting stuck in the mud trying to get to your property. Okay, high water. So many of the properties you may monitor have streams and rivers on them. During your first site visit, it's important that you get familiar with the water on your property so there aren't any surprises when you monitor without staff around. And if you need to cross any streams, please, please, please only attempt to cross when the water is very low you can clearly see the bottom and you're wearing the right footwear to do it. Stepping into a stream without checking it out first can create a truly deadly situation, especially if you're monitoring alone. Um, and, and water is one of those things that's becoming more and more unpredictable. Snowpack, which melts nice and slow into our rivers, is being replaced by heavy rains, which quickly rush into our waterways. And this creates unpredictable and flashy stream systems. So even if you feel like you know your streams pretty well, don't build your site visit around those stream crossings. They can change really quickly and create a pretty tricky situation for you. All right, wildfire. Oh, this is one of my favorite subjects. Okay, as you may have noticed, we're experiencing higher temperatures, more extreme droughts, and seeing changes in vegetation actually, which is making wildfire more common and lengthening the wildfire season. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an example here. The first wildfire in Spokane County this year was in mid-February. And the last one in 2019 was in mid-November. So if we have a similar year this year, that's a nine month wildfire season. So keep that in mind as you prepare for your field work. Wildfire could occur almost any time. And most wildfires start in what we call the wildland urban interface or WUI. <laughs> this is the zone where human development meets open wild space. Riverside State Park is a good example. Palisade City Park is another example. These are areas where people either live nearby or frequently visit with lots of open wild space that can flare up really quickly if a fire is started and not contained. So most of the properties that can accept stewards are within this wildland urban interface. So it's something you need to be, in a, you know, be aware of. Um, so before you leave your home, make sure you check the current wildfire conditions. There are tons of wildland firefighting groups like DNR, WDFW, and the Forest Service that have up-to-date resources. Um, a great one is the link listed here from the Northwest Interagency Coordination Center, which shows all active fires in real time on an interactive map. I love this link. <laughs> it's great. Um, so one often overlooked hazard of wildfires, uh, of, of wildfires is smoke. And there is no healthy smoke. Even healthy people can develop respiratory problems from too much time in wildfire smoke. So please make sure to check the air quality before you monitor, especially if it's visibly smoky outside. So um, here's a chart showing air quality index values. How, how you monitor really is, is up to you. You know, whether you monitor in smoky conditions is your choice. However, 
when air quality index levels, that's AQI, reaches 101 parts per million, I highly recommend limiting your outdoor exposure to no more than a couple of hours. And if AQI reaches 151, please do not monitor. Um, given the current COVID-19 situation, we just don't want you to be outside in the smoke, period. There's no reason to create any extra respiratory risk right now. Um, but you know, even after COVID subsides, please be aware of smoke risk. Okay, I also get a lot of questions about wildlife. What if I run into wildlife? Well, expect that you will. You know, we protect the lands we do because it's good wildlife habitat and you'll be in their turf when you're monitoring. So expect some wildlife encounters. And not all wildlife is dangerous, but it's a good idea to assume that it is and give everything you see a ton of space. Even small animals can get defensive and become dangerous if provoked or disturbed. So if the reason you're becoming a steward is to get out and see more wildlife, I highly recommend investing in some good binoculars so you can enjoy the, that wildlife uh, while keeping a good distance. There are a few critters I'd like you to keep uh, particular attention on while you're monitoring in the field. The first one is ticks, especially in the summer. Um, you may have noticed there are a lot of ticks out this year. It depends on the property, but I usually come home from a day in the field and pull two or three off of me. My record is nine. Um, so wear a hat, keep your hair tied back if you have long hair, and always give yourself a thorough check when you get home. Um, and try to have someone uh, go through your hair for you if you can. They're just really hard to spot. Um, and the ticks carry some pretty nasty diseases. They're, they're really no joke. Um, the, those diseases can be life-changing. So take the time to prevent ticks and then remove them when you get home. Um, and we're just going to keep going with the biters and stingers here, bees and wasps. Um, if you're allergic to bees, um, keep any important medication with you and handy when you're monitoring. And um, be aware that a lot of bees and wasps create underground nests. And it can be kind of hard to know if they're close by. Um, so understand that that is a risk of going out, out in the field um, and, and off trail. So if you hear them, just slowly and calmly leave the area, not a big deal. And uh, have a good first aid kit with you in case you do get stung. Um, we'll kind of go into what is in a good first aid kit later, but um, some kind of good ointment is, is a good idea. Um, another one I want to bring to your attention is snakes. And um, there are a couple species to keep an eye out for. One of them is the gopher snake. Um, this one's pretty common. It's not venomous, but it can be a little bit aggressive. Um, and its bite can cause some pretty nasty infections if the bite isn't washed out properly. So if you see one, don't panic. Just give it some space. The other one is western rattlesnake. And uh, this one's kind of interesting. Rattlesnakes didn't used to occur in Spokane. But as Spokane becomes a little bit hotter and drier, rattlesnakes are starting to migrate a little bit closer into town. They're still not that common, um, but they are becoming slightly more common. Um, so unlike gopher snakes, though, western rattlesnakes are extremely venomous, and you should call 911 immediately if you're bitten. I, I don't want to go too deeply into the wilderness first aid here during this training, but in general, if you're bitten or stung in the field, just treat yourself for shock. That is to say, um, wrap up in any warm layers you have, even if it's you know warm outside, have a sip of water and sit down in a place where people can easily get to you. Um, luckily, like I said, rattlesnakes are still not that common. They're uh, actually a lot less aggressive than their reputation suggests. And they have a nice little warning sound to let you know that you're getting too close. So um, snake -like, snakes like these just are, aren't that common, but they're important to be aware of, um, especially as their patterns change. Um, moose and black bear are <laughs> kind of obvious animals to keep an eye out for. Um, both can be temperamental, 
they can be aggressive and they're big you know they're they're dangerous animals and and their temperament can kind of change depending on the season spring bears that have just woken up from hibernation may be a little bit more cranky than the fat and happy bears you see in the fall and same deal with moose you know mating and calving season can make moose a little bit more irritable so regardless give them a ton of space these animals are really i mean dangerous especially moose uh, of those two you would think that bear would be more dangerous but moose are um are genuinely they they can do a lot of damage um they're they're wild animals we can't predict how they'll react to a new person in their woods so just love them from afar if you see them no big deal all right so now that we've talked about wildlife let's talk a little bit about hunting uh, so INLC is not necessarily anti-hunting, but we don't allow it on INLC protected properties. Many of our land protection partners though, like Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, do allow hunting. So please understand the rules and regulations of your specific property. Regardless of the regulations on your property, please wear high visibility gear in the fall and winter during hunting season. Um, and um, you know, if you just don't feel comfortable monitoring during hunting season, taking that time off of monitoring is completely fine. I really wanna hammer home that your safety and comfort in the field is so much more important than any information you could gather for us. Um, it's also important that you know your hunting seasons, especially if you're monitoring in an area where hunting is allowed. So the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has a great free pamphlet available online which describes the hunting seasons and regulations in Washington state. I highly recommend you print this out and have it with you while you're monitoring. It's got a lot of great information in there. And um, while poaching is uncommon, it does happen. Um, please don't assume someone is poaching. If you see or hear evidence of poaching, call the WDFW non-emergency line um, but if you witness a clear poaching in progress, like someone cleaning a deer in the summer, like they, they're they clearly hunting out of season, please call 911 and be prepared to describe the event and the hunter very clearly. You know, like many field hazards, encountering a hunter or a poacher in the field is just not very common, but it's uh, it's very important that you are informed and prepared and that you wear high visibility gear to avoid any issues. All right, pesticides. <laughs> I, get, I get a surprising number of questions about pesticides actually. Um, so pesticides are used pretty often to treat invasive weeds that don't respond very well to hand pulling or are highly invasive and likely to spread really quickly. So many folks are just not in favor of using pesticides, you know, and I get that they're harsh chemicals. So I completely get that impulse to to not like them. But some invasive weeds just can't be treated any other way. You as a steward can help reduce the amount of pesticides that need to be used by identifying those invasive weeds that can be effectively treated by hand, pulling them and then disposing them off site. The fewer weeds there are, the less chemicals needed to treat them. It's, it's that simple. So pesticides only work if the chemicals can stay on the plant for at least a couple weeks. So long periods of dry weather are needed, which is why treatments are done in late spring and summer when dry weather is more consistent and rain can't wash those chemicals off the plants. So spring and summer is when you can expect to see any kind of treatment area. Um, federal and state laws require that pesticide applicators post notices around those treated areas. These notices will describe who sprayed the area, when, what kind of chemicals were used, uh, when it will be safe to re-enter that area, and a phone number to call if you have questions. Please read these carefully if you find them while, they're mon while you're monitoring, and don't assume that any one of them are the same. So if you run into a notice, please read it. Um, pesticides are also tinted with a specialized dye, usually blue, to make treated areas a little bit more obvious. 
If you see an unnatural blue color on a plant, chances are you're in a recently treated area. Um, I also want to uh, make sure this is really clear. All pesticides are toxic. Even the sprays you buy at the store to treat your lawn are very harmful. Roundup is a great example. The main ingredient in Roundup is glyphosate, which is frequently used not only on your lawn, but in treating invasive species in the field. And it was recently discovered to cause cancer. So even store-bought herbicides are quite poisonous. And if you see notices showing a treated area, please abide by those notices and just avoid that part of the property. It's 100% for your safety. And if you accidentally enter a treated area, which can happen, please leave that part of the property immediately. Um, once you're out of that treated zone, check your skin for those colored patches of that indicator dye. If you do find some color on you, don't worry. Just go home and wash your skin with soap and water. Please do not wash off in any body of water on or off the property. Pesticides can cause significant and lasting damage to aquatic plants and animals, so please wash up at home. It's okay to wait until you get home. Just do it at home. Um, so I know that was a lot of um, kind of daunting pesticide information. <laughs> Please don't worry. Um, running into treated zones, like most of these hazards, is just not that common, um, but it's important that you know what to do if you do run into that. Okay, so given all of those potential hazards, um, here are a couple of things that you should consider. So of course, be aware of the weather, the road conditions, and recall the physical terrain of the property. Um, are you prepared for field work in those conditions? You should ask yourself that before you leave your house. Um, also consider, does someone know where you're going? Make sure to tell someone where you're headed um, and what you'll be doing and you know, roughly how long you think you'll be gone. Just in case something happens, in, in the very off chance that it does, it's good to have someone at home that knows where you are. And uh, also ask yourself, do you have a good first aid kit? Uh, a well-stocked first aid kit can make a huge difference if something goes wrong in the field. Field staff like to kind of joke that the goal with your first aid kit is for everything to expire because you never got a chance to use it. So please be safe. <laughs> Don't don't try to use your first aid kit, but also have the materials you need in case you need them. So here's a list of the materials you should have in a field first aid kit. The pockets, the, the pocket kits you can get at REI are good for cuts, but that's about it. I highly recommend packing a few extras, especially if you have any allergies and need medications close by. Um, so I've highlighted the basics in green, but if you can, Try to pack all of these items into a kit and keep it with you all the time. Those of you that have taken any advanced first aid classes will notice there isn't a tourniquet on the list. Um, we're starting to move away from using tourniquets in wilderness medicine. They're just causing too much nerve damage. Um, and <laughs> also, INLC will not assign any tasks that would put you at risk of needing a tourniquet. And we hope that you would not put yourself in a situation like that either. <laughs> So those are, those are kind of the, the, uh, the essentials for your first aid kit. Um, another thing many of us forget when we go outdoors is, do I have good cell service where I'm going? On your first site visit, um, make sure to check your phone. It's important to know if you'll be able to call someone for help if you get hurt. Um, I get pretty good reception at most of the properties. I expect most of you will too, but make sure to check it so you know for sure. Okay, so you've officially completed the first phase of your training. The next step is to watch the virtual monitoring video. Um, I've included my contact information here. And uh, also remember that I'll be hosting a virtual Q&A session. So you can email me if you have questions, but if you have questions and, and would like to attend that session, shoot me an email and I'll get you squared away with an invitation to that. Um, you'll notice that my phone number says currently unavailable. Um, INLC staff are working remotely from home, so um, 
if you want to call in uh, and, and leave me a message, uh, I can get your message, but I, I will likely not get your phone call. So uh, the best way to reach me right now is to shoot me an email. So um, I hope to see uh, all of you at that uh, Zoom Q&A session, and I hope you enjoy the virtual monitoring video.